Welcome, everybody. This is the 1230. No, it's I'm sorry. It's an 11 o'clock day on Friday. <laughs> and today we're doing satin doll. This is considered a level three class. Level three, we do add some new chords, not a lot. They're all optional. And we are going to do some easy arranging, which means basically we're just going to get comfortable with putting the song onto your instrument. We're not going to do any saving of presets. It's just going to be what buttons can I push on my instrument to make the song sound pretty. So uh, that's basically what we're trying to do in level three is to get you to start thinking a little bit like arranging the song. We're still trying to get comfortable with playing our fingers on, on our instruments as well. So it's kind of that in-between level and it's an awful lot of fun and the book we're using is number 15, Simple Songs. Simple Songs, Oop, a little bit of glare there. And we are on Satin Doll. When we're done with this book, we'll have to pick a new book and we'll still keep it at a level three. For those of you that want to push yourselves, please feel free to come to some of the other classes we offer during the week. Monday at 2 o'clock is an intermediate advanced, and Wednesday at 12.30, and that's all Florida time, by the way, is an intermediate advanced class, too, and I push you just a little bit further. Um, also want to let everybody know that I am going to do after the Monday class, um, that I do at 2 o'clock. I am also going to be hosting a few people that want to learn how to record presets, how to save your presets. So if that's you, please punch into my, my Monday class and then we'll do a short little um, how to record presets at the end of that class. So right around 10 to 3, 3 o'clock. So everybody's welcome to come to that. So please feel free to do that. All right, and that's just a little um, not on the schedule. Um, we're, it's not going to be on the regular schedule, but just a kind of a bonus, a bonus lesson for everybody that wants to do that. Okay, today we're doing Satin Doll, and hopefully you got your printout sheet, your worksheet. I try to give you this week's song and next week's song. Oh, here comes Mr. Parker. Let's let him in. And that gives you a place that you can write down all your notes. Um, if you want, just take notes right in your book. Um, but let's find out a little bit about the song. In 1959, hmm, that was a pretty good year, Leonard Lipton, a 19-year-old Cornell, oh, that's Puff, I'm sorry. Huh, wrong one. <laughs> Written in 1953, Satin Doll is a Jazz Standard by Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. Um, the lyrics were added later by Johnny Mercer. It has been recorded by many, 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 <laughs> including Ella Fitzgerald, the 101 Strings Orchestra, and Nancy Wilson. So this is a jazz standard. Pretty cool. That means you can use almost anything to play it on. The only thing you cannot use, since this is in 4-4 four, four time, you cannot use a waltz. You have to use something that counts to four. And yes, David, if you want to do the Satin Doll Disco, please feel free to do so. I think it would sound absolutely wonderful. Um, it is in song setup, so try that first. Try that first. Um, it does come up to a background on the larger instruments called Satin Lady. Imagine that. It's the signature background written for Satin Doll, but you can put it on just about anything else. I also like it on Jazz Club, and I'm at about 108 beats per minute. Jazz Shuffle is really good. Any of your big bands are going to be perfectly wonderful. On a smaller instrument, standard full band, Frank and the Count is fabulous. Or your traditional guitarist. Traditional guitarist is the equivalent of Jazz Club. So go ahead and use that. And if you, if you caught my Valentine's Week class on little instruments on how to make your pianist and guitarist backgrounds sound more like a full band, that's probably what you want to do. You want to make sure that you've got all the little extra things plugged in so that your traditional guitarist will sound bigger and fuller like an entire orchestra. Check out that, that class because that was pretty, pretty good for the smaller instruments. Um, I think any of your pianist and guitarist backgrounds are going to be good, but I like it with a little bit of bounce. 
Oh, here comes Keith. So make sure that you do it with a little bit of bounce. Now, for those of you who saw Dennis last week, I'm going to be using one of his techniques. See if you can figure out which one it is, because you can learn something from somebody all the time, and that's something that I learned last week. Actually, I knew it before, but it was nice to get a good review on it. And it's called stuttering, stuttering. And it's something that you can do on the piano sound probably the best. It doesn't work as well on the smoother sounds like an organ, but stuttering. So on the satin lady background, and I also want you to see if you can figure out the, the road map. We'll go over that as soon as I play it. Gives you a chance to go get your crayons too. <laughs> Classic, classic song. Yeah. And that was on. Um, yeah. Don't you do that already? I've seen you do it. I do it all the time. Yeah. I, I know. It <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. It's called stuttering. And it's when you kind of like. Yeah, you do that. Of, I do it all the time naturally anyway. Yeah. But it was kind of a good review that it was oh. actually categorized as a technique and a way to play, which was I thought was pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah. I probably learned it from Dennis. <laughs> 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 and also, I have to tell you something. John Riley brought up something yesterday. He was at our store. It was President's Day, and he was at our store. Some of you have experienced him at the other stores. It's wonderful to see him. And he made a comment about how timing is so important. And I kind of poo-pooed him and went, you know, I always tell my people not to count. And then when I was in the shower this morning, I have to apologize, John. John, if you're listening, I do apologize. And I did have an epiphany, especially in the shower this morning, um, that uh, timing and counting are actually two different things. Timing and counting are actually two different things. If you're counting, you're probably playing every note exactly as it is written. If you're using good timing, you are playing along with the background and making it fit the background, not necessarily making the counting perfect. And a, and a good example of that is actually back in level one when we did Ode to Joy. I'm sure you all remember that. And so if we're doing Ode to Joy, and I'm just going to put on a real simple, basic country, since that's what I use. And this is just an example of Ode to Joy. If I were to count it, it would be like this, because it's all quarter notes with a half note at the end. That would be as if I was counting it exactly. Now, if I'm playing it with good timing, 
it's going to be the way I feel it, using those notes as a guide, but it's going to still be in good timing with the background that you've chosen. See the difference? Yeah. Sometimes I hold a note longer than another, and, and that's, that's the difference between actually counting and using good timing. And I always try to tell you, if you play the song the way you sing it, it's going to be right. And it also has to do with which rhythm you're choosing, because different rhythms are going to make you feel the song a little differently. It's going to make you feel the beat a little differently. I just played it on that real pretty um, satin doll, which was a real nice bouncy background. Jazz Club is going to be similar, and then you've also got one called Jazz Shuffle that gives you a little bit of a different type of a bounce. Let's play it down here. It depends on the instruments you're using, and it depends on the rhythm that you're using. But always play it the way you would sing it. Or another way to think about it is think about the instruments that you're using and try to be the instrument. Think about if you're using, if you're using say, a trombone, you want to make sure that you, like Marco would say, don't kill the horn player. <laughs> You want to make sure that you give that instrument space to breathe. You all always have to take a breath if you're a singer. You always have to take a breath if you're a horn player. Now, if you're a piano player, it doesn't matter. If you're an organ player, it doesn't matter. You can slur through everything. But if you're a trombone player or a singer, you really have to watch where you take those breaths. You could not play like this. By that time, your trombone player would be turning blue. <laughs> you did not give him a chance to breathe. Now, here we do have some rests, so it does give you an opportunity to lift your finger. But always think like the instrument that you are playing. And that's uh, just a good piece of advice for any song that you're playing. You, know, you never want to kill your horn player by running him so long that he can't take a breath. <gasps> All you right, know, John, yes. I remember early on, I was um, playing a song, um, and that I was super bad then, and <laughs> was playing a lot while I was, and I thought, oh, God, the song is just awful. I wish I'd speed it up. I didn't know that I could do that. Oh. And, but more importantly, uh, I played it through, and uh, this is awful, and then I heard it on uh, YouTube. Oh, well, by gosh, I'm going to speed it up. Mm -hmm. And it makes a difference. It does. In, in doing that. It does. It does. It Your does. tempo also does make a difference. Now we always play yeah. it slower, especially in the earlier classes, so that you have your give your fingers a chance to learn it. But then you always mm -hmm. want to speed it up to where it feels comfortable and it feels more like you are playing the song. Yep. Yep. And YouTube is a great resource. I use it all the time. Well, you can your colors. You, we got to do a road map here. Sound like it. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, if you when slow you it down it too tone, much. There's no sound. Yeah, you, that's true. <laughs> Take out your colors. Up oh, here comes Luis. Let's let him in. All right. Um, you follow the lyrics. Verse one goes for line one, line two, line three. There in line three, you have a first ending, a bracket, and then you have two dots a thin line and a thick line. Make that a color. Where's that sending you back to? The beginning, because you don't see any opposite facing dots. So your, your dots go back to right in between the 4-4 four, four and your very first A note. That's where you're going to make your other line. All right, now get another color. OK. I have blue. I'm going to do the second verse. Baby, shall we go out skipping? 
Careful, amigo, you're flippin'. Speaks Latin, that's satin. And then the lyrics stop right there, right there where your first ending starts. So I'm going to put a little colorful two right before my first ending bracket. And I can even make an arrow right down to my second ending, which is the beginning of line four. So the second time, you're going to skip the first ending and jump down to the second ending, finish the song. That's it. It's pretty easy. Any questions on your roadmap? Pretty, pretty easy one today. Pretty simple song pattern, by the way, because you've got eight measures. That's your first section. Then you go back and play those eight measures again. That's your second section. It's A section and A section. Then you have the bridge. She's nobody's fool. That's the bridge. It's the one part of the song that doesn't match anything else. And then you go back to telephone numbers. Well, you know. You go back to exactly the same A section that you had over here. And what I did is I just repeated the last four measures at the end of the song to put an emphasis on the end. And that my satin doll. And then played that again, those four measures. Now, you don't have to do that. You could have just hit your ending button, and it would have been fine. But sometimes it's nice to just do a little bit of a tag on the end of your song and repeat either the last four measures or the last eight measures, depending on which one, which place to go back to sounds the best. All right. Let's add some chords. Now, remember, if you're adding chords, they are optional. You do not need to add anything extra at all. And I'm going to add a lot of sevens, <laughs> and they're completely optional. Sevens you don't ever have to play anyway. A seven is a lead-in chord. All right, here's your first question for you since we're doing chords. What key are we in? Any guesses? F. Nope. <laughs> nope. D. C. C. We are in the key of C. And it's funny because you don't even see the key of C until the first ending. Interesting, huh? But you always go to the end of the song. The last chord, 99 times out of 100, your last chord is the key of the song. Now, why is that important? Only for the introduction. You don't need to know what scale the C scale is. You don't need to know any of that. All you need to know is that when I start my introduction, when I activate my introduction, I want to start it in the key the song was written in. And if it's a C, then I want to start it with that C chord. Don't start it with D minor. It's going to give you a completely different ambiance. Here's a C chord. And that sounded right. Even though the first chord I used in the song was not C, the C introduction was the right key of the song. So starting with these chords, D minor, G7, sounded exactly right. If I would have started with a D minor intro, which a lot of people just automatically play that first chord as your introduction, it doesn't always work. If I were to start with a D minor chord, it would actually sound like I was starting a completely different song. Take a listen. Didn't quite sound right. It just sounded a little off because it didn't not, that minor chord gives you that, that somber, kind of mysterious ambiance to introduce this song. And this is an upbeat song, so you really need that major chord, and you need it in the key of C. So you start your introduction. If you have to write yourself a little note, just put intro in C and put your C in a box. So you remind yourself to do that. Start your intro with your pinky on that C, and you're going to be real happy. You may put sevens on every single chord in line one, if you wish. If you don't want to do it, don't worry about it. 
because a D minor 7 is a three-fingered chord, and it is a little harder to play than just D minor. You have to play the D and the F for D minor, but you can also add the C. C, D, F. G7 is, of course, F and G. Then the D minor 7, or just plain old D minor is all you need, and then a G or a G7. Now, the second line, we're toggling between two different chords, E minor, which is E and G, or E minor 7, which is D, E, and G, dinosaurs, elephants, and gorillas. And be, I'm going to take it off of this and just put it on easy. And then you're going to an A or an A7. And remember, you can play A7 with your thumb on the crack of both the G and the A. So your hand wants to stay in one spot. Now you have a C minor chord. I'm going to change that. Change it to an A minor or an A minor 7. A minor is C and A instead of the C minor. That C minor just sounds too dark in that spot. So an A minor, which is C and A, and if you want to play A minor 7, it is A, C, G, and A. And again, your thumb can go on the crack of the G and the A at the same time. Then the D7 is C and D. Remember, sevens are optional. You don't need them. Now we have our harder chords. These are the two hardest chords in the song because we very rarely play these. And it's an A flat minor. A flat minor. And if you want, you can make it an A flat minor 7. Oh my, how many fingers is that? Only three. Just because you have a flat symbol and a minor symbol after the A does not mean that that's a three-fingered chord. The A flat is just one key, A flat. The minor is what adds the second finger. And it's always the letter, which is A flat. It's that middle black key in the set of triplets. You're going to add three up. One, two, three. It's A flat and B, butterfly. And if you want to add the seven, it's actually the G flat. It's the A flat minus two. But don't struggle to learn something that's going to be super hard. You have to play the A flat and the B. So just mark those two in there. Now you have a D flat. That is a one-fingered chord. Remember, just because I'm adding a symbol to the letter does not mean I add a finger. So the D flat is actually going to be this one down here, same as a C sharp. A D flat seven is actually D flat and B. Now, why is that significant? Because if I'm on an A flat minor, guess where my thumb is? It's on the B. So all I really have to do is pick up my pointer and put my pinky down on the D flat. Aha! I didn't even have to move my thumb. Sometimes you, when you have common notes in your chords, you don't have to even move a finger. A flat minor, D flat seven. If you practice that, it'll be very easy when you get to those two chords. Then you're going to go to a C. Now, first ending, we're going to add three chords. So get your pencils. C is good for two counts. Beat three, which is over the half rest. Over the half rest, beat three is a D minor, dinosaur minor, or D minor seven. The D minor is D and F. The seven is C, D, and F. The last measure of that third line, beat one, E minor, elephant minor, E and G. And if you want to add the seven, it is the D, but that's the, that's the optional note. And beat three, middle of the measure, A alligator or A seven, which is C, I mean, sorry, G and A with your thumb. 
So that whole first ending is going to give you this kind of a chord progression. And it's just a moving chord progression, so you don't have to worry about putting in a fill, but you could do that. You could just play the C chord and then play a fill and be fine. But I think you're going to like how the chords progress as you play those four chords. And it gives your fingers something to do, and it just makes for a nice moving sound that leads you back into the second verse. All right, let's go to line four. You have a C chord for one, nope, I'm sorry, two counts, two counts. Over the half rest, B3, put an F, F or an F7. F7 is E flat and F, otherwise just play F. Then the second measure, beat one over that half rest, go back to a C. So your first ending, and again, it's just a little bit of movement. It's a little bit of movement so that it says we're at the end of our section. Now we're going into the bridge. This would be a, a place where you could actually change keyboards or punch a different preset to get a new sound. She's nobody's fool. The G minor is the hardest chord you ever have to learn because you have to get your hand out of position. It is G and B flat. G with your pointer, B flat with your thumb. If you wish to add the seven, you may, and it is an F, F, G, B flat. Your next chord is a C or a C7. Here again, you're going to have a common note. It's going to be that B flat. C7 is like this. So you don't even have to move your thumb. G minor, C7. You can always add a note to your chord. You just can't subtract a note to a chord. OK. Then you're going to do that again at the top of the page. G minor may have a 7. And then you're going to a C7. But you have to play G and B flat. Those are the two you have to play. Now, the next two measures, we're going to have four chords. And again, it's to create that motion of chord progressions. So the F in measure, th measure two, you're going to make an F major seven. Now, that's optional. You don't need it. But F capital M-A-J seven is E and F. Remember, major sevens are jazz chords. And it's always the letter minus one. That's just a cool sounding chord. Beat three over the half rest. You're going to put in a G minor, gorilla minor, G and B flat. The last measure of the line, line one, beat one. Put in an A minor or an A minor seven, C and A. And if you want to add the seven, it's the G. And then over the quarter rest, beat three, before you play the C quarter note, you're going to put in a B flat minor. B flat minor is two fingers, B flat and D flat. And you should put the D flat on the bottom. Dinosaur flat and butterfly flat. And if you're unsure, always check your window to make sure that it is indeed the right chord. So now that progression is going to sound like this. Pretty cool. And all that does is it keeps your fingers moving. It gives them something to do. And it gives your ears a moving chord progression, which sounds really pretty. Line two, you may put a seven on the A minor or not. You may put a seven on the second A minor or not. Remember, the sevens are all optional. And at the end of the line, you may put a seven on the D minor, D and F, if you wish. Next line, you have a G7. Now, you heard me play some notes in there. They're not written, but I'm going to tell you what they are. Switcheroony, OK? When we get to the switcheroony, you're going to add some notes. You're going to play.
So when you get to the switcheroonie, you're going to put a D on the fourth line, then go to an E on the top space, then come down to a C on the third space, then go back up to the D on the fourth line. So now you don't have to stop and say it, switcheroonie, you can actually just play it. That sounds pretty cool. All right, the D minor on line three, you, you may put a seven or not. Sevens are optional. And the next D minor, you may also put a seven. Let's go to the next line, E minor. E minor is E and G, elephants and gorillas. You may put a seven on it, which is the D. And there again, you've got the E minor toggling back and forth. Basically, we're just going back to everything we did at the beginning of the song. So if you've got it right up here, you can just transfer it over. So E minor 7, A is good. E minor or E minor 7, A or A7. The C minor, cross it out and make it an A minor or an A minor 7, going to the D7. And then you have your two hard chords, A flat minor and D flat or D flat seven. Remember, if you play the D flat seven, it actually makes it easier. There's your A flat minor and the D flat seven. You just have to reach up and put your pinky down on the D flat. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so Go ahead. On the first page at the bottom, the last line, uh, at the second ending, you said a, a C chord. Was that in the second measure? Yes. You're going to have a C chord. That first C chord goes for two counts. Then you're mm -hmm. going to put an F in beat three or an F7, fish. And then measure two, first beat, go back to the C. Oh, okay. Thank you. John? Yeah. Can you repeat line three, that run? Line three in the first ending? Or line three in the second page? No, uh, the first ending. First ending. Okay, your chords are C for two counts. Beat three is a D minor, dinosaur minor, D and F, and you can add a seven if you wish. The second measure of the first ending, which has that whole rest, beat one, E minor, or E minor seven. Beat three, A alligator, or A seven. Got it? Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. The hardest part of the song is that you've got two chords per measure. So you've got to keep on moving that left hand. So the left hand is the most important hand in this one because this hand you're just going to be dancing on the keys. And you can do the Denisaw stutter or you can just play it the way it is, but play it the way you would dance it. Play it the way you would sing it, and it's going to be right. All right, so what else did I play this on? Frank and the Count. This is for smaller instruments. If you've got standard full band, this is what this one's going to sound like. And remember, you start your intro with C. Do not start it with D minor. Write yourself a note. <laughs>
okay. Man. And up and down keyboards, wherever you feel like it, you've got, you've got very distinct sections. So at the end of section one, before going back to the second verse, or you can play the same sound for both of them, it's okay. The bridge can be a different one or not, or poke a different preset. And then when you get to that last section again, you could actually change it one, two, three. You could actually have four different, complete different sounds if you want, because you've got four complete different sections. So pretty cool. Now, what happens if you love the song and you just want to keep playing it? How about doing a transpose one. and play it again? Hey, Fred, what can I do for you? Hello? Okay, on the easy four, <coughs> excuse me, in song set up on the easy four, they have a traditional guitar. That's yes. where they put you. And they yep. add the jazz. Yes. The, yeah, traditional guitarist is that jazz club. I love that one, too. Yeah. And your song setup is probably going to make it fuller than just pushing traditional guitarist. Because remember, when you push traditional guitarist, you don't get any drums, you don't get any lower chord, and you don't get any orchestral, orchestral sounds to really fill in. So your song setup probably gave you something right. really nice. Yeah. And how fast did it have you going, Fred? Lost him. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'll have to look at it. Okay. I'm, this, this came up at 108, so I just left everything at 108. Now, that's, again, you can play it faster than that no. or slower than that, depending <clears throat> on how you feel. Set and doll set up on fanfare comes up at 100. Okay, a little slower. Yeah, yeah a little that's... slower. Mine four. But it's in uh, jazz guitar. Yes, jazz guitar is a one. And uh, octave sax. Nice, yes. Octave sax and piano on but the you, bottom. Yeah, but you notice which instruments it's choosing. Uh, yeah. it's all, they're always choosing like a big band instrument right. and a piano because it's, it's a classic piano piece, it really is. But any of your big bands did this. I mean, Ella Fitzgerald did this. So any of your big band sounds are going to be excellent. And any of your big band rhythms or standard rhythms are going to be excellent. And don't be afraid to get out of the box. And I know David is sitting here going, when is she going to play disco? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to play disco for David. And I'm just going to use, I'm going to be at 108. But you know what? Disco sounds good with anything if you were a 70s baby. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Now I had that, to change my feel. Huh? I said that changes the whole complexion of the song. Yes, it does, doesn't it? I had to change my feel of how I played the notes to match the rhythm. Even though my tempo is the same, my rhythm is not. It's doing different things. So you have to adjust the way you play the song to what the beat is doing. So it works. You don't ever want to fight your background. If you find that even anything that I suggest or that your song setup suggests, if you're fighting the rhythm, then guess whose fault it is? Not yours. <laughs> Not what yours. tempo did that come up at? Um, I turned it down to 108. It came okay. up faster than that. I, I just turned it down a little bit. I just left all my, all my, my satin dolls I've been playing at 108. Now, you can up it or lower it, depending on where you feel. Usually, disco is between 118 and 120. Okay. When it comes up. Yep. But, yeah, it gives you a whole different feel. I didn't try this on Latin, but I can imagine that's going to give me a different feel. Dottie, this one's for you. You like your Latin. Let's do a rumba and see if Satin Doll sounds good on a rumba. If now, I have to adjust the way I play it according to the new feel of the rhythm.
added a couple little trills and things in there because that's what the Latin guitarist would do. But yeah, it it changes the way you play it. It's the same notes, it's the same tempo, but it changes the way you play it on the rhythm that you chose. Now I know there's going to be some of you out there that are going to say, okay, I'm going to play it on a waltz. <laughs> it, I'm not going to say no, but you know what? No. <laughs> a waltz counts to three and it's going to be very, very hard. <laughs> okay, let's do some fingering. We still have time. Um, so get your pencils out. If you don't need fingering, thanks for coming. I love you guys. Next week we're going to do Sing, Sing a Song. The Carpenters did it. It's, it was actually written for Sesame Street. All right. Here we go. A2. G1. A2. G1. A2. A2. G1. A2. B3. A2. B3. A2. B3. B3. A2. B3. D5. C4, D5. B flat 3, A flat 2, B flat 3, G1. It's not too hard. The hardest part is coordinating them with all those chords because there's a lot of them. All right, the, set, the second ending, the last line. She's no, oops, let's do the first note. Dal is a G1. Let's go to the middle of the line. G1, C4. B flat 3, A2, G1, A2, B flat 3. Top of the page. C4, B flat 3, A2, G1, A2, B flat 3, C4. The last note on that line, C4, D5, C4. B3, A2, B3, C4, D5, C4, B3, A2, B3, C4, D5. Switcheroony can be pretty much any fingers you want. Whatever fingers get there first. Telephone numbers, A2, G1. A2, G1, A2. And if you take a, a notice, does the exact same numbers we used over here in the first section. Well, you know, A2, G1, A2. Fourth line, B3, A2, B3, A2, B3. B3, A2, B3. D5, C4, D5, and the last line, B flat 3, A flat 2, B flat 3, G1. Not too hard. It's just lots of chords and getting it coordinated. But I think you'll find that the chords are what make this song move. And then just dance. Dance on the, on, with your fingers. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Don. Yeah. Do you have any time to maybe just kind of review the stuttering, how you used it in this song? Yeah. Basically, when you're on any song and you've got a piano on, you just kind of bounce on it. If I played it exactly, because remember, what happens to a piano sound? When you play a piano note the, uh, on a real piano, the hammer hits the string, the string vibrates, but then the vibrating fades and stops. So if you're sitting on a note, and this is not really the greatest song to demonstrate it on because you've got a lot of fast notes. You don't have a lot of whole notes on it, but you just kind of bounce on the key more than once. If you've got like a half note, uh, let's pick a different song. Let's see what else I got here. Let's see what I got. All right, let's try My Funny Valentine just for fun. Let's go to a ballad. What am I? Oh, I could actually stay on Jazz Club with that. That would be fine. Jazz Club, slow it down. 
Okay, let's try this on my funny Valentine and see what I can do. I don't know if it's going to work on this. to hold a note for a long time, the piano's not going to hold it. So sometimes you just kind of bounce on it. Sometimes you, you play it two times. Kind of you're stuttering with that piano. And you just do it the way it feels. And after a while, it starts to become natural. You don't want to force it. You want to just make it feel like you're dancing and on, on the keys. And because that whole note is going to hold for eight counts, the sound is going to die away before you are actually done with that. So there's several things you can do. You can either use this, just do a little noodling with it, or not. You could actually just pick up your finger and do a fill-in. So there's several ways to get around that, but that's what stuttering is all about, is just kind of bouncing on your piano keys. And, and most of the time it is a piano that you're going to do the stuttering on. Does that make a little more sense? Did that answer the question? Okay. Try it because it's fun. And yes. it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just fun. If and if you're playing it on satin doll, I didn't do it as much. Oops. That's what I wanted. Ah, stop it. <laughs> more than one time on each note, but you're yeah. still keeping it in time. You're not counting exactly what's there, because if you're doing that, it's going to be. If you're counting it exactly, that's the way it's going to sound. It's, it's going to sound very stilted, because that's easy play. That's just the way it is. But if you dance on it and play it according to which kind of a rhythm you have on, then it's going to be a little bit off the beat, a little bit in between the beats. You're going to stutter a little bit. You're going to dance on the keys. And that's okay. really what it's about. So basically, Dawn, what you're doing is you're hitting a flat key and just sliding down to the note real quick. Sometimes. That's a grace note. That's a grace note. If I hit a black key, that's a grace note, and then slide to a white one. That's part of what I do when I, when I play a piano, is I, I will do a lot of grace notes. Sometimes but, I'll even do what I call a double grace note. I don't know what the real name for it is, but I'll do the two notes right before and just kind of roll right into it. Well, when Dennis had his uh, his uh, class, mm -hmm. he said, you know, hit the black note and slide down. But I, he didn't call it a grace note. Though. That's yeah, that is a grace note. If you hit a black note and slide up, that's a grace note. Mm -hmm. Either way, up or sliding up or down. Um, I'm not going to say no to that, but normally a grace note is the black note that's underneath the down. You're going to slide up. If, so if you're going to, from an F sharp, you're going to go to a G. Now, don't quote me as that being gospel law, because I've seen Marco do up to down. But he's the only guy I've ever seen do up to down. Everybody else goes down to up. And there's no time value to it. I think it was actually a mistake that was turned into a style. <laughs> Dennis calls that a roll. A roll, like 
like that, a roll. Yeah, that and would be a roll. Slide your finger down. You don't hit two notes. Ah, okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. In fact, he rolled his finger to do uh -huh. it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I do I do a lot of that. I do I call that a finger roll. When you're going from one note to another, it's kind of like a glissando. And and different artists are going to call it different things and do a few different things, and it doesn't really matter what it's called. If you like it, try it. If you there are no rules as far as noodling around with your fingers. And pick something up. I pick something up from every artist I watch and try it. And sometimes they work for me and sometimes they don't. And it doesn't matter. You, uh, after a while, it, it starts to incorporate into your style because every single one of you has a musical style, believe it or not. Even at level two and level three, you are starting to really get your own musical style. <laughs> Some better than others. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you all have your own your own personalities when you play, when you play, and you'd be amazed. Um, before I was the teacher here, oh my God, that was back when dinosaurs were around. Um, oh. yeah, um, After, I used okay. to sit when the other teacher would would have a class. If somebody would go to play an organ, one of the students, I would sit in a different room and. Uh, we would try to guess who the player was yeah. just by their musical style. And normally we could get it mm -hmm. because each one of you has your own musical style. And you pick up tidbits and pieces and, you know, I'll play some Albertisms and I'll play some Den Denisisms. And we all pick up styles from watching other artists. And then we develop it into our own type of a style. And that's... That's what happens. You know, you watch all of us, and you might say, oh, I like what Joe Pontesha did here. And so you pick it up and, and add it into your repertoire of how you like to play. And sometimes it's just a matter of be just the way you do it. How do you touch the keys? Are you heavy on the keys? Are you real light on the keys? And that's you developing your own musical style. <laughs> Dawn? Yeah. Uh when you on the stuttering when you start the song mm -hmm. uh if you just hit a da 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 uh-huh get a good stutter i one, usually do one a little... more beat yeah okay usually i do a little roll before that i usually do the the rolling two from two keys down But I do it naturally. So try different things and see what works for you. Yeah. See, now you're starting to think like arrangers. <laughs> and for the rest of you, if you don't feel like trying that, guess what? Don't worry about it. Play your big band instruments, pick a rhythm, and go and have fun. And that's what it's about. Never make it a chore. It should be playing the instrument not working at the instrument, so always keep it fun. You guys are the awesomest. You really are. Next week, we'll do Sing, Sing, Sing. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'll see you all again next week, and it will be March. It's going to be a new month. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Terrific. Yeah, you're terrific, John. <coughs> oh, thank you, guys. I can't do it without you. <laughs>